seven. Oh man. LC eight, the Ocho. <laughs> Lincoln Center, the Ocho. Mike, thanks for doing this because I'm not going to say that publicly. Yep. I, I totally understand the reasons. <laughs> Chris <laughs> with the Theragun killed me though. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm going to sneak out and, and turn the rice in probably another like 10 minutes. Because. <laughs> Is that a euphemism? Was that, that's a real thing? No, no, because I am cooking rice for my son and my wife is gone. <laughs> that's amazing. And the house, the house He's like, sick. Chris, we have um, one bye. more question for you. Well, there he goes. There he goes. Uh, How old is your Jasmine son? Jasmine Rice, be right back. 15. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's, I got to get one of those. 15. No, no, you're good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it for everyone. <laughs> Save yourself the trouble. Lynn, how are you holding in the midst of the madness? We're good. Um, where are you? We're in Montauk. They're in Montauk. Oh, okay, that's right. You said you were in Montauk. Word. Nice. Freed. What up, guys? Great to see you. Good to be seen. <laughs> only nice to meet you, Mike. Brown pair of shoes. Is that what you said? Brown pair You're of the shoes. only Zoom my whole vacation. Can, Freed? Can I call you Freed? No. Sure. That's not true. Reed, how long did you work on this? How many years? Uh, 15 years from the first shoot date to the release. Okay, so, hey, I'm good <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> you can be heard. <laughs> jump, go ahead and jump in. Uh, good evening and welcome to a special film at Lincoln Center virtual event. Uh, my name is Alexandra Salati. I'm the membership manager with Film at Lincoln Center. And I'm so glad that everyone out there is joining us tonight for a live Q&A about the Hulu original film, we are freestyle love supreme. Many thanks to our friends at Hulu for this event tonight. And joining us, we're pleased to have director Andrew Freed, producer Thomas Kale, and freestyle love supreme troop members and Hamilton stars, Chris Jackson and Lynn Manuel Miranda. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by comedian and drac of all trades, Mike Verbriglia. Before we get the conversation started, I'd like to just shout out some exciting announcements from Film at Lincoln Center. The 19th edition of the New York Asian Film Festival will begin streaming virtually beginning on August 28th. This year's lineup features a majority of titles directed and led by women. Earlier this week, we announced the closing night selection for the 58th New York Film Festival, Azaziel Jacobs French Exit, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Lucas Hedges. And if you're not a member of Film at Lincoln Center already, you can become one today to receive exclusive pre-sale access to the festival at discounted rates and be in the loop for more announcements coming soon. Just visit our website, filmlink.org for more information on access. And thank you again to everyone out there watching for supporting us. Film at Lincoln Center is a nonprofit organization and our work would not be possible without our dedicated members. And now without further ado, I'll turn this over to our host, Mike and our very special guests. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome um, to uh, to a celebration at Lincoln Center of this uh, this brilliant documentary about freestyle love supreme. Um, uh, we have uh, we have our actors, we have our director, uh, all with us here. Uh, does anyone does everyone want to say a quick introduction of themselves to explain their involvement in the project? Hi, I'm Lynn Miranda. I am a lyricist and occasional performer. Thanks for being here. Uh, Thomas Kale, director of the stage show Freestyle Love Supreme. I'm very private. That's all you'll get out of me. Uh, Chris Jackson, bull. <laughs> Andrew Freed, filmmaker. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> Thanks go. for tuning in, YouTube. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Um, I, have, I have joke questions and I have real questions. This is a documentary that's, by the way, if you haven't watched it, it is on Hulu. It is, uh, I loved it. I've seen it twice. It's very, uh, it's a very emotional film. It, it hit close to home because I made a, a, a narrative film about an improv group um, called Don't Think Twice that is not dissimilar plot-wise, except that it's, this was real people. Um, so I, uh, I have joke questions and then I have real questions. I'm gonna start with the joke questions. Lynn, 
How does it feel to be the weak link? <laughs> Listen, with, with hard work, all things are possible. Um, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad I'm, I get to play with these guys every day. Every day I get a little bit better. I get a little closer to thinking of things that rhyme in the right order. Tommy, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, how does it feel to be the villain of a documentary? <laughs> better than you'd think. And uh, I think Andrew had a very heavy hand in the edit. I appreciated that. Um, you know, there was a lot of VFX because I was wearing a black hat for most of it, but that felt like it was a little on the nose. But I just tried to speak my truth. I just tried to speak my truth. It's legit. My favorite part of the movie is the point at which uh, you get notes from one of your closest friends and oldest collaborators on an early on your off-Broadway version of Hamilton and you and you didn't want to take the notes because you were like, it's done. That's correct. <clears throat> I love and, that. Well, I, Mike, you and I have spoken and you've told me many times that my notes are not welcome. So I realized that probably also hit close to home for you. Uh, well, you know, look, uh, Anthony Minizioli, who I created the group with along with Lynn, I met my second day of college in 1995. And we've spent the better part of 25 years collaborating and being each other's lives. This, you know, what Andrew gave us in this documentary was an opportunity to basically have this visual scrapbook that we were allowed to share. And in doing so, it felt like there was an opportunity for us to talk about the things we talk about in our life that happened to us in our life. And and I feel like if you tell someone with real specificity, then it can transcend and become universal. And so this strange improv group that took these elements of hip hop and, 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 and comedy and, and music and kind of merged them together is, you know, a, a pretty small, you know, pretty small target to hit, but it's really about the the family that you choose and how you are identified by those family members over time. Would they have chosen you? <laughs> I mean, I'm technically one of the chosen people, but that's just a a, a, a film at Lincoln Center reference. Um, <clears throat> Andrew, uh, how did it? How how difficult was it to to make these untalented hacks seem interesting? Uh, lots of hours in the edit. Um, really, you know, the, the, the original title of the film that I wanted to make was called Tommy Kale's Hair. Um, and it was just going to be a, a story of the evolution of, of Tommy's hair through different, <laughs> different eras of his creative journey. Um, no, this, this, this whole thing for me is, um, it's actually it continues to be a pinch me moment. You know, just the, the idea that, I started filming these guys a decade and a half ago. Um, and, you know, we're, we're able to share the, the footage and the story and be able to look back on it with some context and, and some appreciation for where they've been and, and you know, what, what we were all together for the beginning of. Um, and so all kidding aside, it's, it's every second of this has been a thrill and I, I would feel bad even poking fun at them behind their back or to their faces. Chris, um, uh, I'm a huge fan. Have you? Oh, thank you. So don't take this the wrong way. OK. <laughs> this is the Joe question, right? All right, we're good. Have you considered singing lessons? Like, I <laughs> doing great work, but it's like, what you know, you're here. You could be here. You know what I mean? I've been begging Lynn for lessons for 18 years now all he does is write songs but to for me but but to his credit he he makes sure that he's in most of them with me so right. i'm never i'm never alone and and that um you'll never walk alone I'll, footprints in the sand my friend that one set of footprints that's you where were I, carrying that's where andrew andrew was filming that when he carried <laughs> yes you. and yeah, yeah it didn't make it didn't make the edit but it was there um <laughs> Or the cobblestone streets in 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 Scotland. Though it was a very uh, meaningful time. Yeah, I you know I I I I'm hoping to elevate the the status of the hanger on to like a completely <laughs> new height. <laughs> you right? you and me both, Chris. A badger, Tommy and Lynn for jobs, and and for whatever reason they they've taken pity on me and and that's how we roll. Well, I. I feel like genuinely like the thing that I find baffling when I watch the movie is I'm, I'm watching that footage from 2005 
And if people haven't seen the movie yet, of course, watch it on Hulu. But it's a documentary that 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 uh, follows this hip hop improv uh, group, freestyle improv group from 2000 footage as early as 2003, I'd say. And, yeah, I. And it just I'm watching it going like, what? How did you know to shoot it? I I saw one improv show, one show, one freestyle of Supreme show in July of 2005. My friend Brett was telling me I should go see the show. I should go see the show. And, and finally, I went to Ars Nova where they were doing a run. And after seeing that that one show, I just I just knew there was something special about it, to be honest. And I, I, I this never comes up, but like the music was a big part of it for me that night, as I remember. Like, I remember just like watching Shockwave, who's the percussionist and beatboxer in, in, in the show, but watching Shockwave and Arthur and Bill and make music uh, was a huge part of it for me. And, I, and, and, and the rapping and the comedy and all of it rolled into one was just uh, impressive. And so I didn't know, I didn't know that it was going to be this, but I did know that that I should start capturing what was happening in front of me. And uh, a few weeks later, I found myself sleeping on on these guys' couch uh, in Scotland while they were performing at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And, you know, we I was trying to make a TV show with them back then. Like, I, I was not imagining that we were going to end up premiering at the Sundance Film Festival and, and having this feature film, but... Mike, um, I'm sorry, Mike. I feel like your parents are in danger of not ever meeting and you're fading yes, away. I, it's, a, it's completely back to the future, right? He's <laughs> yeah. wearing the Mickey Mouse yeah. and it comes up playing the oh, bass. There's gone. The there bass is player's <laughs> gone. It's terrible. There you are. Left. Nope. <clears throat> you're gone. Adjust the, I'm going to adjust the light to <laughs> here because uh, it is. The, He's really on a beach somewhere. This is incredible light. Backlight. He's a bit of a. This is Michael Crichton film. There we go. Nope. Right. Lost it. Just well, here I am. This is uh, better than anything it, we could be saying. <laughs> at least it's not live, and we could just cut all this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll cut out the yeah. part where Mike's parents never met. <laughs> all right. Mike, you know you're invisible? <laughs> I'm aware. I'm aware. All right. I think it's better this way. <laughs> it's, it's not worse. It's not worse. It's just a logo of your show. All right. <laughs> That's true. Um, the, uh, so you just started, Andrew, you just started rolling. I'm going to go, you know what I'll do is I'm just going to go to, I'm just going to take away the virtual. Oh, God, now you're, <laughs> <laughs> now you're, Michael Crane is good. He's an amber, right? Like he's like Jurassic Mike. Mike, uh, we're we're like six months into quarantine. Is this your first Zoom? <laughs> I don't do these. I don't do these too often, actually. Jeez. You're a little yeah, over yeah, you, you're you're on little the sun. You got the, you got on the, the glare sun. from the sun. It's like changed. Yeah, oh, no, okay. yeah. Well, it's not a full green screen. <laughs> I just uh, I just got this for the freestyle event today. So oh, it worked great. great. Well, it's over, so <laughs> it went well. <laughs> So when you started, Andrew, when you started filming, what were you shooting on? Uh, uh, XL1, I believe it was. I got, I keep the tapes on my desk still, a few of the tapes. So that says okay. FLS. The mini DV um, tapes. Yeah, mini DV. Um, yeah, we were, we, we just, I, 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 my boss at the time, John Kamen, who was my boss at Radical Media, uh, gave me five thousand dollars to go to scotland and film whatever i could film and so the best invest it was plane tickets for uh greg Brancala and myself and and i hired a sound guy in scotland which was the best investment i think that you know some of the best producing i've done in some time because the, the sound even of those shows from 15 years ago um sound really good in the film chris was saying this thing in in the film where he talks about like the emotion that the audience gives you in in a live performance and like that there's nothing there's sort of nothing that can duplicate that what was do you guys have any memories of like a particularly like emotional response from an audience member from a freestyle show 
Oh God. The, the second chances are very sure. cathartic. Um, we do a game called second chance where we ask someone to give us a regret yeah. and it can be anything from, I pushed my sister like in the pool to, I mean, and sometimes we get really yeah. deep stuff and then we- someone, I shouldn't have gotten married. Remember, didn't someone say they shouldn't have gotten engaged? Oh or? yeah. <laughs> well, that comes up every show, but we, you know, we took it that show. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, cause they're, they're always trying to be funny and then we call them on it and they go, oh, oh, you really meant uh, an answer. Like you wanted something you could dig deeper into. I, I thought I was just being a cute jerk from the anonymous audience. <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes we've had just people in tears because we've done some ridiculous musical theater rewrite of their life. Because we always somehow invariably make them president or make them solve world hunger or have some familial um, reconciliation that may not have happened in real life. Um, right. And and it gets it gets very cathartic. Uh, you know, we just we go where they where they tell us to, and we in, in second chance we go where it hurts. <laughs> we like dig in. I feel like with right. I feel like when I'm watching you guys rap, I'm just going. I'm I feel anxious for you that you're gonna say something that you regret moments later. Do you feel that? No, you kind of can't um, because you, or you kind of tell yourself you will, um, you know, you will say whatever sort of comes out of your mouth. And um, and the, that's the thrill of it. And that's the fear of it. And I think we reference it in the movie that like Utkarsh and I in particular, our stomachs like have not yet adapted. I mean, I'm 15, yes. 15 years into doing this, but my stomach is still like fight or flight before I go on stage, like, wait, what are we doing? We haven't rehearsed this. It is the anxiety dream of, we're doing a show tonight and you don't know your lines. Yeah, when I oh. did a free, I did a free, I was on a split bill during Fleet Week for, uh, <laughs> with with the an FLS cast that was not you guys. It was, uh, I think it was the Broadway cast at the time. Um, and, uh, the bathroom line was long with FLS. Bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's only one bathroom backstage, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> so when I saw the movie and you referenced that, I was like, he's not kidding. Yeah. No, it's, it's, a, that's not a joke. It's a race to be last to the bathroom before you get on stage. <laughs> we still love Supreme. But, um, you know, that being said, it's also, that's also part of the fun and we fall on our faces and we call ourselves out on it when we do it. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, that's the, that's also part of the thing. And that becomes a part of the inside joke that comes around over the course of the night. The audience is there with us as we eat shit. And you, I, I, informs it. I, had, I had a moment down, downtown off Broadway where somebody went to a nail salon and, and it's the first time in 15, 18 years of doing this, but like, I went into like this really, really angry nail salon uh, <laughs> character who I actually go to when I, you know, in the four times of a year that I get someone to work on my nasty feet. And it's a caricature, but it was one of those situations, it was one of those circumstances where I was literally doing a direct imitation of the woman that I have seen. But yet it, it, it you know, we were just flowing but I thought about it for a moment and it's the first time in, in the, I don't know how many shows that we've done where I thought after the fact, oh God, I could have offended someone in like a real way. And I didn't sleep for like two or three days. Oh my God. I mean, there were multiple calls where I was like, and it was after all of these times, because the reason why the, 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 slope, the, the slope can be slippery, but not as slippery as it is, is because we're hyper aware of, you know, what good is doing a show if we're, if we're, you know it, that we're, where we're trying to show camaraderie and 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 ingenuity and love most importantly like nothing comes from a, a, what we do from a place of like we're just gonna shit on somebody unless they're obviously like a bully or an ex-husband or the president um that with that we 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 don't go after anybody but you know there are, it, it it is a tightrope and after 18 years it's like that one time where i just i'm sure it didn't feel that way to the, anybody in the audience, but I felt that way. And I didn't sleep for two days, you know, cause it's just, it's outside of the purview of how we're kind of doing, doing the thing, telling the story. Um, I will, I will say this. You know, 
I will say this about the movie itself is that, you know, the for a freestyle show, especially the l- most recent iterations of it, they take your phones, right? It is it is oh, a safe place where it's not it's not recorded. That was part of the responsibility and I think the pleasure for me in making this film in that like this is as much of a record as exists of most of these shows as as there is. And so you know, it is that safe space. You can sort of do whatever Tommy and Lynn are doing right now. And you can like, it, it's fun and it, it, it disappears um, at the end of the show, except for, you know, some of the footage I've been lucky enough to have. And Andrew, how much footage did you cut from? Sorry? How, how much footage did you cut from? You shot most of Off-Broadway, right, Andrew? Yeah, we, we of the 40 shows that you guys did downtown, I think we filmed 22 of them. Um, and then we, I had the three shows from Scotland. And then, you know, that, that's the show footage. The footage that we cut the whole film from was, you know, a lot from 05 to, I guess, 09. And then this latest batch in, in 2019. And, you know, the, the phone element was something that came up in a very sort of like, uh, you know, like early conversation we were talking about being, you know, back on stage and, and Lynn said, you know, and I think maybe when it would seem like Chappelle or, or someone like, you know, who had come in and done a comedy show where they took your phone and the sense of liberation that exists, you know, a lot of it was about context. Our show was about context. So things taken out of context can be, um, you know, uh, devoid of that context, you know, just play in a, in a way that just kind of lays there and doesn't, you know, and doesn't land and, and, and you know, when Lynn said, hey, if we take people's phones, we're protecting ourselves. Uh, and that felt, you know, that felt like something that was really worth doing. But what we didn't understand or intend is that the audience would feel so present because what it, what it also prevented was the moment you walk in the theater until the show starts, nobody's really talking to each other anymore. And what you're doing is you're getting that, that last gasp, God forbid, we're 80 minutes without you know, sending a message myself included. And so when people started putting their phones away, it made it in- intensely safe and actually mirrored what we try to create on stage. And one of the things that happened both anecdotally and also critically when we were downtown in particular, the first time it happened, because I think we were the first show to have it happen on Broadway. And I think that's going to be a new trend when Broadway you know, eventually comes back and people feel safe again, is that there was this, there was this, this contract that if you're here, you're here. And the critics wrote about that too, which was um, something that I, I, I think was sort of this unintended pleasing thing that the audience felt that much closer to the group. Tommy, what do you do on the show? Say again? Um, uh, my, my job on the show <laughs> is really just like to harness all of this energy. So, you know, the, the thing that makes us a little bit uh, strange on other shows is the thing we try to embrace here. Anthony had this idea really early on. He and I would talk about making something. He and Lynn started working on this when we were doing In the Heights, at, you know, in early development at the Drama Bookshop in 2002, 2003 is really when Lynn and, and Anthony started sort of planting the seeds for this and then invited me to an early show. And I went to go see the show, which if I remember was this like 45 minute amorphous sort of booze fueled rap um, with no beginning, middle and end and like Bill Sherman on a saxophone. Uh, and I thought if we could apply some, you know, some kind of structure and just create an environment where everybody here could do their thing, take all the stuff we loved about improv and comedy, bring it with us, the things we loved about hip hop, bring it with us and see if there could be some sort of fusion there. And then just, we met people along the way, you know, so when we met Chris, I don't know that Chris knew this was a thing that was necessarily in his future, but he just jumped in. And so that's kind of how the group built over the years. But can I say like on a more day to day thing, what Tommy does, he'll be like, Second chance is getting long, guys. <laughs> Second chance is always long. Second chance is getting long. Lynn, like maybe 10% less cursing during Foundations of Freestyle. <laughs> same notes. And I'll, I mean, I've been getting the same note for 15 years. Um, so it's, it's also like to a person, like what's the thing that will create the tightest 80 minute show? What are trends we're going towards? What's growing? What isn't? What's working from the audience prompts? What isn't? He's the one sort of outside, sort of. I'm still not getting it. Tommy, what do you do? (laughs) Mike, you know when your show goes too long and I'm like, you should make it shorter. 
<laughs> I do the same thing here. And, you know, and it's much more like coaching than anything else. But yet you take all the things that you usually do as a director and you bring them with, right? Like you have whatever conversation you have that needs to be independent of the relationship you have with the other person in the room. It needs to be, you know, code switching and trying to find a way to communicate this. But also no one has ever left a free cell of Supreme Show saying, I wish it was longer, right? We're always, you know, you it's like do the thing and get out. Yeah, like yeah. that's you know that's that's usually the big note. Shoot me an email later with your answer of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have your email, Mike. It's just me. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go to the audience. Uh, Ashley asks, "I'm fairly new to freestyling. My fears and insecurities restrain me from showing this to anyone. What advice do you have for those like me with insecurities?" Hey, awesome. Zach. <laughs> fly in the face of them share it with as many people as you can that's what's going to come know. out first yeah you'll have the four lines that you planned in your head to seem clever and then you'll have to keep going <laughs> and then yeah. all of the brown water in the faucet comes out like because this is a faucet that has never been opened before and everything that should not have come out will come out and you'll get your way through to the clear water on the other side. But you have to, yeah. I mean, the most fun thing about freestyle is when you kind of get there, it's this thing where you're totally present and you're taking in information and spinning out information at the same time. And your insecurities won't have time to get into the stream. They're, they're just gonna have to sit on the side because you've already spit them out and you're, you're on to the next thing. I feel like when I'm watching the documentary and when I've seen you guys live, like. I feel like I'm just watching this magic trick that I can't even surmise how you arrived at your lines. I, there's no question there. <laughs> no question for the questions. Um, Kelly Zillow asks, is there any person you would like to join FLS on stage as a future surprise guest? Oh, the, the toughest one that we just never quite made work with the schedule was uh, Black Thought, Tariq of the Roots, oh my um, God. who is yeah. such a beast. Uh, he's just such an incredible improviser yeah. and freestyler. And he was game and he was trying to do it, but he had his Tonight Show schedule and we just never quite made it work. But that's, that's first on my list because I've seen it firsthand now. And it's, you know, I mean, we mentioned it in the doc too, like that. Yeah, Andrew, his, his section in Freestyle the Art is so inspiring yeah. to me. Yeah, Andrew, I thought that was so smart to include that because Lynn talks about freestyle and Black Thought, or I'm sorry, uh, Questlove and and, uh, and and Black Thought, and then you cut to this clip of them freestyling, and it's and it really is shocking. Like you can't believe, like he's just like I think I forget what it is. Like he's like he has a tree wall, <laughs> and he just goes, he just goes, it's amazing. But uh, Andrew, did you did you how did you think through like integrating that into the into the film? Well, I, a lot of it had to do for me that like spending time with these guys through the years, it has been like an exercise in extreme foreshadowing. And I knew going back to the footage that there was a lot of that kind of stuff there. Like the idea that in 2005, you know, in the flat in Scotland, when I was interviewing Lynn, he's telling me stories about Quest Love and Black Thought. And then we're going to Jimmy Fallon you know, and the guys are sort of announcing their Broadway run and they're, you know, warming up with Quest Love in, in, in the lobby, you know, in the hallway outside. Um, there are happened? lots of that happened. I wasn't there, so I, 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 I didn't know. I just, just <laughs> I was just, just curious. <laughs> Tom, Tommy, 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 oh, Tommy we lost Lynn. You know, like I said, hangers on, we can't complain, but we're here. <laughs> We're always here. We're I'm going to take this opportunity to talk it's about okay. Andrew for a second. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things, look, and this is, there are, there are, you know, obviously documentaries that have um, chronicled over long, long periods of time. Richard Linklater made a, a, a narrative about it. Michael Apted very famously with Seven Up and and that series. But you know, this was not somebody who happened to have some tapes, even though they are on a shelf, and then did some interviews later. You know the there's obviously great compassion and care for the group and the, the film that Andrew made. And it's also in some way, I feel like it's a, 
this is what it feels like to be with the group for better or for worse. It's like a meditation. Like this is actually what it feels like. And to have captured that is, you know, in, in, an, in a form of improvisational theater that disappears as soon as the night is over, except in the memory of really the audience because the performers have to let it go. It's like connect four. You can't, some things stay with you, but when you've done a thousand shows, they go somewhere else. And I feel like the fact that this exists and is now carved into something that doesn't just disappear is a gift. And you know, and the fact that other people are finding it and liking it is is amazing. But it, it's uh, it's something that I think we all have a, a, a deep sense of gratitude about. And, and again, and and I'll I'll sort of follow it up, like because we made a joke of it, but it's all in there. Like these guys are rapping about their pictures being up at Stardies. These guys are are talking about things that they sort of willed into existence. And I, I don't know that everyone knew where they were heading, but. I, 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 it's it's not a huge surprise when you see the things they were talking about 15 years ago and then what they've been able to accomplish. It's that's that's what the fun part for me at least. This is from Jessica Gonzalez who asked drama book regarding drama bookshop for those of us uh, who don't know what it is. Can you explain what it's about? The purpose of it? Is there a date for reopening? Then you want to speak to it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so we are. Um, we're under construction on Drama Bookshop 2.0. It ran some 90 some odd years under its previous ownership. Uh, and um, we owe it a great debt. Uh, the people in this room, but Tommy and I in particular, it's where we met, it's where we created In the Heights, it's where FLS had its first show. Um, and so we are under construction one block south of where it used to live. It's on 39th between 7th and 8th instead of 40th between 7th and 8th. I hope you will go with us there. Um, but you know the the we are in the same sort of in terms of opening we're in the same holding pattern as as anybody else we are we're we're rebuilding and um and and you know the hope is by next year to be uh, operational that one block will kill you though i'll tell you yeah. um, right into the fashion district <laughs> from theater to fashion in one block <laughs> melissa martin asks was there anything in the film you really wished you were able to include uh but couldn't for whatever reason andrew uh, yes, there, although I think it ended up being better, but there was an early version of the film where, uh, Anthony grabs the guitar and just starts strumming and Lynn broke out into the Smashing Pumpkins song, uh, tonight, 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 tonight. tonight. And we used it as this like grand transition to play time from like 2019 to 2008 and, the first time I saw that what the editors had built with that, like it really was emotional for me. And it was, you know, it's, it's a lesson in the edit room. Uh, Jonah Moran, who's a, a collaborator of, of these guys as well. We used to have a rule, like never say that something is your favorite part of the movie because that guarantees that it's not going to make it, it in. Make it, yeah. um, and so I, in me, believe I can't clear that. We can't clear that. Corgan. <laughs> I still, I still refer time to it as the Jonah rule and it, it's and it never is true. time at all. Yeah. Billy Corgan didn't, never want, didn't want that in the movie. <laughs> the, <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> there's a terrible sound you're making. Um, there's another <laughs> moment. A lot of the film sort of that is it. about our, our founder, Anthony, moving away and what that did to the group. It's also in the film, uh, Don't Think Twice, uh, which is a oh, narrative God. feature. Um, also the new one now available on <laughs> um, So there was actually, there was, there was a television show that we made for a network called Pivot in 2014. And we came up with this song game, which was called like On the Fence. And it was a debate. And in one of these live shows, which we filmed, the question was, should I leave New York and go to San Francisco? And Lynn argued for San Francisco and Anthony argued for staying, which is of course like this sort of, this great definition of irony. And in this <laughs> back and forth, Lynn says to Anthony, why did you leave? We could have been huge together. Why did you go? Like it, like the whole thing. It's like it it stopped it being about the audience member and it became primal screen was, therapy. Wow. Yeah, it was That's really awesome. intense. And, why and, did and you leave? We could have been huge. I think I yelled. I yeah. literally they, I did too. I literally said I had an improv group uh, when I moved to New York, and we were called Little Man. We performed at UCB, and Nick Kroll was in the group, and um, among other people uh, who were great, my friend Ed, Brian, Conrad, etc. And um, and my friend Chris Fosdick, who was I think the best improviser in the group, 
was moving back to to Chicago uh, to have a family and leave show business. And I was like 23 years old. And I was like, I was like, don't do it. Like, don't you understand? We're going to make it. <laughs> and, he's, and, he's, and he he looked around the bar. We were at McManus Bar uh, and, and on 19th. And, and, he, and he goes, I look around at the people who made it. And I just don't want to be these people. And it, well said. Yeah, I mean, so that, that and that that's why that part that storyline in the movie really connected with me because it was it is it, there is some of that. Yeah, and, and Anthony moved for love, and Anthony moved yeah. for the expression of happiness, and built this family. And so, you know, we didn't film you know just because of like time and some other things the the Broadway experience too much. But watching Anthony walk in the stage door of the Booth Theater on Broadway for the first time. I mean, awesome. I, I was sitting, you know, I was sitting on stage and I looked over and there he was checking in with the doorman, this, this thing that he'd watched so many of his pals do that he had come through as the friend of, and now it was his show. And it said created by outside for him. That was enormously meaningful. And, and uh, that happened, that, that got to happen. And yet he was already full. He didn't need that to be full. This is um, Sydney, who is eight years old in Brooklyn asks, how do you make up your raps on the spot so quickly? Lots and lots and lots of practice. Um, I'll tell you, my, specifically for me, when we started doing this, I was cheating. I was thinking of punchlines in advance and then just kind of trying to keep it together until I could say my cute little pre-planned punchlines. And I found invariably when I did that increasingly, I would say the punchlines first and then just say a lot of nonsense <laughs> afterwards. <coughs> and so you realize, oh, you actually have no choice but to stay present. And slowly you kind of build a language filter in your brain. It's like learning any language. It's like you do it enough and patterns start to come up and you can express anything that you're feeling and find a way to make it rhyme and find rhymes along the way. It's sort of, um, you know what the best example is since you were eight years old? It's like in Lego movie, when they learn to build ships out of whatever Legos are around. Uh, the Master Builders, I just rewatched this with my five-year-old yesterday. Um, and you go from doing the sets, which is most of us talking, and oh, how are you, and how is the weather, to I can take this, and I can take this, and I can build a ship. Um, that's what you learn to do over many, many hours of just saying words over beats. I, actually, that segues into Alvaro Medina's question, which is, what are some of your favorite practice exercise games that keep you getting better at freestyling? Just doing it. Practicing a lot. Spending time every day rhyming ideas. Looking around the room and looking at a tree and then looking at the bird in the tree and the color of the bird and the color of the sky and the temperature outside and your favorite song that you heard and re rewriting your favorite song in your head using different words and, you know, l thinking of different melodies and different musical styles. It's like really spending time practicing all of those thought gymnastics so that you have uh, a bigger bag to pull from, you know, when, when you get together and, and, and then get on stage. And I always like watching you guys do the non-rhyming stuff. I was just about to bring up the non-rhyming game. We do a yeah, non-rhyming game. So it's sort of like it's sort of like working the reverse muscle group where I will say a line that has a very clear punchline and the person can't say the obvious punchline. So it'll be uh, you know um, night into day, the moon and the sun. You know, um, I had a lot of work, but we're gonna have a good time. <laughs> You know, you set up what is a very clear rhyme and the person can't say it. Um, they have to s twist it or zig or zag. And it's, um, it, it keeps you out of going into the expected rhyme. It really kind of is like a muscle, like developing against, you know, rhyming moon and June and wishes and dishes. Um, so uh, that's a really fun one we do off stage, and it always breaks our brains. What do you, like, I feel like the movie alludes to it but I don't know if you speak to it directly is like, what do you think of as the DNA connection between the musicals that you wrote in freestyle? Oh, for, I mean, opposing muscle groups is the perfect way to think of them because if freestyle, if you're freestyling, like at your pinnacle, you're truly present. 
Um, you are not thinking about the past or the future. You are just trying to respond honestly in the moment. And when you're writing a musical and you're asking these characters to interact with each other, that's what you're chasing, right? You're chasing the honest moment, the honest reaction. Um, and so by being in that adrenalized state in front of people, um, you're just more in touch with that. You're more in touch with what is Benny going to say when Nina has told her all this? And it's then can I say I couldn't get my mind off you all day? It's, you know, being learning what the right response is in that moment under duress. It also is like a forever cure against writer's block because you can slap yourself in the face if you're feeling stuck and being like, you did a 90 minute show last night off the verb gesticulate. <laughs> you don't have writer's block. <laughs> Um, I'm so, sorry, Mike. Are you talking about the musicals that I wrote, or? Oh, Chris, we're going to get to yours. We're going to get to yours in a few minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get confused. ninety yeah, minutes yeah, is eight so minutes long. too long. Lynn, the show should be 80, 80 to eighty-two minutes. Solid so. eighty. I know. I just cursed. So even much. even when you even when you describe it, it's too long. Tommy, I was just curious. Are you, would you consider directing a show with just Bill playing the saxophone? <laughs> yes, I mean, Free Self Supreme was actually. All of this stuff orbits around that. Let's be honest. You know, one of the things that they're saying that I also think is is it's still going. You know, the solo from that first show is still going. It's, <laughs> it speaks to it. Is that one of the things? One of the questions is about sort of how do you get better at this and you develop this. The reality is because we've kept so much of the structure the same over time, the containers the same, but the content and the, the the contents of the container are what evolve. So that's usually get you past glibness and get you to more truth. And I feel like that's something that that Lynn and Chris and the rest of the group really. Uh, you know, testify with in each show and you can watch that evolve from, you know, from the early days and, until, you know, the more present days. I feel like when I'm watching the documentary, one of the things that's really exciting about it is like, it feels like a blueprint for the show to live for 40, 50 years. Like it can keep evolving, right? Yes. You, you guys yeah. think of it as a show that will just go and go with more casts and. Yeah, we've, we've added, you know, we've added, I think, nine new members in the last year after having the same eight members for the first, and obviously we weren't working straight for that, that you know, those 10, 12 years, but absolutely. And, and Andrew lays the film out in a way that shows the structure of the thing. And yet, depending on who's coming in, we'll also retailer and, and make new ideas for them to thrive. Like, I think that that's part of it. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're planning on going on tour again once people start, you know, feeling comfortable, you know, next year all around the country. And our hope is there's 15 people you that you've never seen who can come and do this show, and they're they're playing on stage with people in the dock and people that's you know and that you that have been doing it for 20 years. So I, right. I think that's the hope. Yeah, Anissa and Kayla, who you see towards the end of the dock because they sort of joined us on the Broadway run. I mean, they're incredible, and they did a lion's share of the Broadway run of the show, and and you know, yeah. and, and and so many more folks like that. And the show becomes its own, like. It, it, it iterates because as new people sort of play with the thing, right? Like the shows that I saw with Anissa and Kayla became, you know, have all these new colors and, 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 and sort of details to them that is their interpretation of what that basic form was. And I think the movie does lay out like the intention of a lot of these sections of the show and then it's like, this is what this is. Now let's see what these different players would do as they bounce off each other, uh, you know, in the bouncy house kind of thing. As a form itself, it grows within within itself. Like, you know, you can envision Coltrane playing his first show and, you know, or or anybody doing their first performance on, on in, in anything, you know, your, your first set. Like, <clears throat> you once you get inside of the form, that's when you really start to grow inside of the form. Right. Uh, it's the idea that, you know, prior to Lynn writing in the Heights, we hadn't seen hip hop in Broadway uh, uh, in that Broadway sort of uh, mold. And now because of those two shows, uh, um, now you've got musical theater students and kids like me who were coming up not thinking that rap really applied or hip hop could apply to that that form. I thought everybody had to look like Stephen Sondheim to write a musical and I had to sing a completely different way. But now, I, you know, through this work, you know, have inspired, I know I've been able to inspire other folks that could see themselves inside of a form. And that's what freestyle, I think, does. You kind of create the the bench by which, you know, you get to pull from. 
there's no re- it's, it, it is like playing jazz though it's a very specific thing but the, but folks kids who are coming up you know are going to see themselves inside of that because they they've got the experience of this film and and the shows that we've been able to do it's, it's a really really cool feeling to know that we've created something that that young artists can grow into as well and aspire to it's a different kind of skill set for that i think that's like really that's really emotional and it's really succinct what you're saying and it's really inspirational and like i i I wonder like uh do you like lynn like do you feel like i feel like you've you've evolved so much as a as a as a writer do you see yourself going somewhere else that's aspirational from here like because you've changed the form in so many ways as a writer yeah, I mean, you're always trying to write the thing that scares the hell out of you, right? Like the stuff I'm working on now is 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 in a different territory than than the stuff I've worked on uh, before. But again, like you you also want to build. Like I always think of writing as like those old commercials for the DeVry Technical Institute. Do you remember those commercials where it was like, we'll teach you how to use that tool. And once you use that tool, it goes in your toolbox. And like at the end of two months, you'll be a you know, whatever the hell they were learning it to fry. Sure. Yeah, refrigerator repair or whatever the specialty was. And like, you know, you learn each tool one at a time. And I feel like with every project I work on, I'm trying to get like another tool that I can uh, use and apply to, to my writing. A- and freestyle is sort of the gift that keeps on giving in that regard. Because even while we were, you know, at the end of last year when we were performing on Broadway and I was doing it two or three times a week, um, it was always like sort of a, a shot in the arm to my writing. If I felt like I had a writing assignment, I was stuck. My wife would tell me, you should go do the late show. Cause then you'll come back and you'll want to write. Cause yeah. there is not a freestyle show I have done where I didn't leave being like, Oh, I could have said this. I, I remember watching clips of you when you were doing it, where you'd come on and they'd be cheering the audience would be cheering for like two minutes and you're rapping while they're cheering. And it's like, how do you even deal with that as a performer? Um, well, it's, but it's, it's like when a famous comedian pops into a tiny club, you've got the goodwill for the entrance, but then you better be funny. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if Seinfeld's going to try out five minutes at the comedy bing bang barn, like easy that's a good club lynn (laughs) he's going to get the goodwill of oh my goodness we're seeing jerry seinfeld but then he's also got to be funny like pretty quickly thereafter and work on the stuff so like that's only the like hey we know who that is like that doesn't actually get you through the show it's just a nice little burst in the arm and the fun of it is like i can say anything i want because they can't hear me i'm just (laughs) I think the, the moment Andrew chose for the show, I'm literally singing Getting Married Today from uh, Company. <laughs> I'm not even doing a real rap song. I'm going, thank you all, is everybody here? Because if everybody's here, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. And like, they don't, they're like, ah! <laughs> they're not well, was, that the show that's, was that the show that Sondheim was attending? Yeah, Sondheim was in the audience okay. that day. So I was like, I'm going to hit him with the, with the hard stuff. Well, the... Uh... <clears throat> This was awesome, you guys. I, I I love this movie. I I love the show. I, I'm a fan of all of yours, and uh, and it's uh, people. If I'm sure people have seen the movie, if you've seen the movie, tell your friends uh, to see the movie. It's one of those things where I I was a fan of the show, and watching the movie for the first twenty minutes, I was like, oh yeah, this will be like just watching the group, and then you realize there's so something there story wise. That's so much deeper and so much more emotional. And uh, just congratulations on making such a special movie, you guys. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. To Thank talk you to so me. much. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. And Tommy, what do you do again? <laughs> I'll meet you on the next Zoom. <laughs> Marty McFly. All right, McFly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks.